Towards the end of the war, a series of key strategic victories shifted the long-standing balance of power in favor of the Arm Rebellion. Control over the few significant concentrations of resources left in the galaxy gave the Arm a crucial edge over the core. Outmaneuvered and outgunned, core forces everywhere were systematically wiped out. Finally, all that remained of the once proud Empire was its command center, the planet Core Prime. Core Prime too would have fallen were it not for the unmatched skill of the sole surviving Core Commander. A shrewd tactician and ruthless warrior, the Commander repelled every arm attack to approach the Core homeworld. Despite superior numbers, armed forces were unable to overcome the Commander's cunning defense. The stalemate ended when armed forces somehow made their way undetected onto Core Prime. At the time of the initial invasion, the Corps Commander was undergoing routine maintenance and was deactivated by the Arm before a response could be mounted. The Arm had known precisely where and when to strike. The Corps was surprised by the Arms having reached the planet's surface without detection. Central Consciousness, an enormous collection of linked mines located on Corps Prime itself, directed that the planetary security mine cluster be scanned for anomalies. Meanwhile, armed forces continued to appear in increasing numbers. The Corps Commander, now reactivated, immediately launched into action. The Arm Kabot Lab had been neutralized, but the threat to Corps Prime was far from over. An Arm Company captured a guard post on a major thoroughfare and began destroying Corps transports as they arrived. Valuable cargo was lost, including important experimental personality hybrids. Central Consciousness increased the processing partition for planetary security and added 40,000 new mines to the cluster. The Arm had established a major base on Core Prime, causing the Core Commander to speculate that the guard post ambush on Thoroughfare 405 had merely been a diversionary tactic. The Corps was now aware that the invaders had arrived through a series of galactic gates leading directly to the Corps' home world. The terminal gate would be invaluable if it could be captured intact. It would allow the Corps to begin a retaliatory attack which could change the course of the entire war. using the Arm's own gate against them. The Corps Commander carried the conflict back to the Arm outpost at Barathrum. Barathrum was a young, molten planet and had been a key strategic victory for the Arm due to its enormous wealth of mineral resources. Retaking it would be a heavy blow. Minerals were the prize of Barathrum, and the Arm was mining them at a phenomenal rate, often using equipment which had been captured from the Corps during the occupation of the planet. The Corps commander realized that the key to a successful campaign on the boiling world would be to halt these operations, cutting the Arm off from the metals it so desperately needed. Troops were mobilized with a simple strategy, search and destroy. The element of surprise allowed the Corps Commander to establish a secure foothold on Barathrum. Armed forces were disorganized at first, and the planetary terrain allowed the Corps Commander to effectively adopt an isolate and destroy strategy, retaking the planet one crustal at a time. The campaign on Barathrum was nearly at an end. The arm had been pushed back to a relatively small section of the planet. Eager to take the fight further before the arm could effectively fortify its defenses, the Corps commander dispatched scouts, certain that they would find a galactic gate which would lead deeper into arm territory. Aqueous Minor had begun its dry season, a 200-year period during which rainfall was almost non-existent as water collected and froze at the poles. 
The Corps commander arrived to find small, barren islands poking their heads out of the thickening, salty seas. The arm was waiting. The Corps commander felt that the arm could be effectively challenged on the open seas of Aqueous Minor. Gaining access to those seas would be a key strategic move. The arm had apparently reached the same conclusions, as all routes to open waters were heavily defended. During this period of the war, arm commanders were frequently accompanied in the field by a K-Bot model known as the Zeus. The Zeus was heavily armed for defense while the commander was otherwise occupied, and it was often fed key information and used as a go-between when other lines of communication were down. A Zeus found on its own was usually on such a mission. When time was too critical to allow for true patterning, an enemy unit could be brought over to the core side without duplication using a simpler process known as impression. This was done with the captured Zeus K-Bot, and it was discovered that the Zeus possessed valuable information indeed. Rouge Pelt was an inhospitable world. A frequent hail of meteors, actually pieces of Rouge Pelt's demolished moon, rained down destruction on the inhabitants at unpredictable intervals. Nevertheless, it had been a core stronghold for over a thousand years before arm invaders had been able to capture it. The core commander intended to show the arm that the battle was far from over. Having occupied the planet only recently, the armed forces on Rouge Pelt were not particularly well entrenched. The Corps commander was often able to corner, isolate, and destroy individual armed garrisons while sustaining relatively few losses. Rouge Pelt was fraught with natural obstacles in addition to armed battalions. The most notable of these obstacles was Xantippe's Abyss, a yawning, bottomless chasm that spanned a continent. There was some speculation that the chasm was not natural at all, but that in the early days of the war, one side or the other had, in its reckless enthusiasm to wrench the resources from the ground, simply cracked the planet in two. For some time, core scientists had been experimenting with a new type of all-terrain tank, but so far their mindware had failed to adapt fully to the motor difficulties involved in controlling such a machine. Personality hybrids had shown some promise, but the prototypes had been destroyed by the arm during the invasion of Core Prime. Now it appeared that the arm was conducting similar experiments, using Rouge Pelt as a testing ground. Water was an especially important resource for the arm, whose soldiers still made use of organic components. Nai Palago was a principal source of that water. Once covered completely by a single, vast ocean, the planet had been drained to the point where small land masses were beginning to appear. Battling the arm so deep within its own territory proved difficult for the Corps commander. Defenses were strong on Nyapalago, and the armed troops fought intensely. Strategic analysis had detected a weak point, however, a key fusion plant located inside a massive volcano. Much of Nai Palago had fallen under the core onslaught, but the arm still possessed a naval fleet large enough to cripple the invading force. The fleet had assembled at the harbor on Vibreen Atoll and was poised for the attack. The K 
campaign on Nypalago was lengthy and ferocious. Casualties mounted on both sides. The Corps commander could feel the closeness of the Arm home world in the desperate fury of the Arm troops. The Corps commander emerged from the Galactic Gate onto Aegis, a small, low-gravity moon orbiting the Arm home world. The campaign was nearly at an end. The moon would be taken swiftly and used as a staging ground for the final assault on Empyreon itself. The Corps had reached Empyreon at last. The lush hillsides and tranquil forests of the Arm homeworld were interrupted only by massive gun emplacements, K-Bot factories, and laser towers. Success or failure here would determine the final outcome of millennia of war. The morning was unusually calm. Perhaps the most impenetrable of the Arm strongholds was Montaginet, set deeply amongst the massive mountains of the planet's southern hemisphere. It was the linchpin of Arm resistance. There were only two routes in on the ground, and initial attempts at breaching them had failed. The Corps commander readied an all-out attack. Just as it seemed that victory was at hand, the Corps suffered a serious setback. Arm troops, fighting with stubborn desperation, blasted the Corps line and breached it. Corps forces, taking heavy casualties, were driven back and finally regrouped on high ground. They were surrounded. The Arm had been driven back high into the hills of Empyreon. There, the troops massed for a final, desperate stand. No quarter would be asked, none given. The Corps intended to destroy the Arm completely, finally ending thousands of years of war. The Arm would fight to the last. It was near the end of the war, and after four thousand years, the Core Empire stood on the brink of final victory over the Arm Rebellion. Arm forces throughout the galaxy were overwhelmed by the superior numbers and firepower of the ruthless Core. Their bid for freedom nearly lost. The battered remnants of the Arm military clustered in the single star system which contained its home world, Empyreon. Empyreon too would have fallen were it not for the skill of the sole surviving Arm Commander. A shrewd tactician and resourceful warrior, the Commander took advantage of the system's relative isolation and was able to keep the enemy at bay. Arm troops weathered wave after wave of core attacks, and it seemed as though they would be able to do so indefinitely. The stalemate ended when a small core insertion team managed to slip through planetary defenses and establish the last of a chain of space-folding galactic gates which led directly to the surface of Empyreon. A decoy engagement was staged at the Arm outpost on the outer planet of Calibran in order to lure the commander away from Empyreon, leaving the planet virtually defenseless. The invasion began. Although they had managed to free the captured gate and return their commander to Empyreon, armed troops continued to weather attacks by Corps forces in increasing numbers. It became apparent that the Corps had managed to construct a K-Bot lab somewhere on Empyreon itself and was building an army as fast as it could. It was during the conflict on Empyreon that armed scientists made a dramatic breakthrough with a new type of all-terrain tank. The control brain tissue for these vehicles was hybridized with clusters of nerve cells from spiders. This allowed them to overcome the perceptual difficulties which had previously made such complex modes of locomotion impossible. The new spider tanks would give the arm a considerable advantage on difficult terrain.
The core invasion of Imperion reached its most critical point when core forces destroyed one of the major planetary habitats and used the raw materials to construct a full-scale outpost. The core base extracted resources directly from Imperion itself and began producing battle units at an alarming rate. This represented the foothold needed by the core for the success of its invasion of the Arm homeworld which in turn would ensure the arm's final and complete destruction. The core invasion of Imperion had failed, although the remaining troops would fight on until they were destroyed. It was then that the arm commander recognized the singular opportunity to take the offensive using the Galactic Gate against its creators. It would be the turning point of the war. Following through the core gate, the arm commander made a bold counterattack on the core outpost from which the invasion of Imperion had been launched. Thalassian, a windy planet largely covered by water, had been captured by the core quite recently. Core forces there were unprepared for the sudden appearance of an arm commander in their midst. Using the advantage of surprise, the arm commander set back the core line on Thalassian and established a beachhead at Larab Harbor. Meanwhile, however, core forces on the rest of the planet had had a chance to regroup. They were certain to attack. With arm presence once again firmly rooted on Thalassian, the commander began dispatching scouting teams in search of further objectives. They were successful. A squad of PT boats discovered energy patterns matching those of the core galactic gate emanating from one of the northern islands. The island was heavily guarded. It would not be taken easily. Making use of the second captured core gate, the arm commander took a step further into core territory. Tergiverse IV was once a sparkling water world like Thalassian, but had been drained dry, its resources used elsewhere in support of the war. The core had tapped into the last significant source of water remaining on the planet, a large underground lake more than a mile beneath the surface. Confronting the core was difficult on Tergiverse IV, where its forces were already well entrenched. Armed battalions were hard-pressed to reach and destroy emplacements in protected locations, such as the Bromid Maze, a complex natural canyon formation. The tactical advantages to the core were such that even the arms' speedy, fast K-Bot scouting teams were often cut off and surrounded. Core resistance continued to increase during the fighting on Tergiverse IV. It was clear that they had begun to consider the Arm Commander a serious threat. If another gate were to be captured, the Arm would be deep within Core territory. Core resistance continued to increase during the fighting on Tergiverse IV. It was clear that they had begun to consider the Arm Commander a serious threat. If another gate were to be captured, the arm would be deep within core territory. The arm commander had reached Barathrum, a turbulent young world whose surface was just beginning to cool. Barathrum was a key strategic point, fabulously rich in mineral resources. It supplied a large percentage of the metal used by the core throughout the galaxy. Control of Barathrum was critical. The fight would be intense. When it appeared that its control of Barathrum might be compromised, the Corps began concentrating its efforts at Crustal 7, a readily defensible strongpoint above the sheer cliffs known as Landown's Interface. 
It amassed a sizable arsenal and initiated the construction of a major firebase to dominate the area. The Arm had achieved near total victory on Barathrum when core tank battalions instigated a renewed assault at Crustal 19. Arm casualties were heavy as they were assaulted by wave after wave of powerful walking bombs. It appeared that the core was protecting the galactic gate located on the Crustal. Wary of the Corps' massive efforts to protect the gate on Barathrum, the Arm Commander took an unprecedented action and expended the vast quantities of energy necessary to send a scouting team ahead before crossing the gate personally. The team did not return. The destination world, Rouge Pelt, had long been occupied by the Corps and no Arm personnel had reached the planet in over a thousand years. Pushing the core back across Rouge Pelt, armed forces were confronted by a tremendous wall of rock which stretched from horizon to horizon. There appeared to be only a single slender pass through. The core would certainly be waiting there. The armed commander had a firm foothold on Rouge Pelt. But defensive fortifications were strong as a result of the Corps' lengthy occupation of the planet. They would be difficult to overcome. And now, there was a new threat. The Corps had built a powerful nuclear missile silo, which was about to become fully operational. Several months into the Rouge Pelt conflict, the Corps surprised the Arm Commander by capturing and holding a number of Arm units. This was an unprecedented tactic for the Corps, who typically did not take prisoners. The captured units were allowed a brief communication with the Commander, during which they indicated that the Corps had connected their pain receptors, usually left inactive in combat units. It appeared that the Corps intended to torture and kill them as a frightening demonstration for the remainder of the armed troops. The increased determination and apparent desperation displayed by the Corps in its defense of Rouge Pelt did not go unnoticed by the armed commander. Rouge Pelt was not an especially resource-rich planet, which led the commander to suspect that the effort had more to do with what lay past the next gate. Core Prime could not be far beyond. The commander had reached Dump, the solitary moon which orbited Core Prime and served as the principal repository for its waste materials. Thousands of years of garbage filled once majestic canyons and lay strewn over the moon's surface. Preliminary reconnaissance indicated the dump did not appear to be well defended. Presumably, the heavy resistance was being organized on the surface of Core Prime itself. Core Prime, center of the Core Empire, was a bleak metal graveyard. Organic life had been extinguished long ago. In the stillness, the low hum of electricity could be heard everywhere, emanating primarily from the massive computers which lay beneath the planet's surface. The outcome of the fighting here would determine the fate of the galaxy. The arm was in trouble. Its forces were put at a severe disadvantage by the tremendous reserves of power the Corps had stored on its home world. However, probes revealed a massive array of energy storage plants located not far from the Arm front lines. A successful strike against them might turn the tide before it was too late. Defenses on Core Prime were severely damaged by successful raids on Core energy storage facilities. 
Corps forces fought with increasing vigor and desperation as the arm prepared to cross the sea known as Aqueous Body 397. Across it, on the planet's largest continent, was Central Consciousness, the massive computer mind cluster which controlled the Corps. During the final days of the war, ARM Intelligence uncovered a secret core project underway on the core home world. Abandoning its attempts at clever strategy in favor of sheer firepower, the core had developed the Krogoth, an enormous, nearly indestructible killing machine crammed with a staggering array of the most advanced heavy weaponry available. The juggernauts were being manufactured on a heavily fortified island on Core Prime. The arm staged a desperate assault on the island to try to stop the project before the Krogoths could turn the tide of the war. Central Consciousness was a conglomeration of the minds of millions of individuals selected for their knowledge and abilities in various areas, whose principal business was control and administration of the core empire. It was primarily housed underground, in a tremendous computer which covered most of the continent. Its size made direct attacks ineffective, but ARM Intelligence had discovered the physical location of its distributed processing control center, a point of vulnerability. Central Consciousness was smashed, its control centers burned out, and power systems in ruins. The Corps commander and the remaining Corps forces had regrouped to make a final stand. No quarter would be asked, and none given. The arm would not rest until the Corps had been wiped out completely. The fate of the galaxy must be ensured. For the first time in 4,000 years, the galaxy was at peace. The arm had achieved its final victory, wiping out the malevolent core completely, and the last hundred years had seen a glorious period of rebirth and reconstruction. But now, rumors had surfaced of a terrifying core contingency plan involving a commander left dormant in the Ocelon system, a small cluster of planets at the galaxy's edge. Ordinarily, a single commander would pose no threat to the revitalized arm, but the rumors also told of an ancient alien artifact which the commander would be able to incorporate into a terrifying weapon, one capable of wiping out the entire galaxy in a single cataclysmic blow. A seasoned arm commander was dispatched to the Ocelon system to investigate the rumors, beginning on the watery world of Hydros. The rumors of a core contingency plan had proven to be true. The arm commander had encountered recently constructed core units on Hydros. Though no evidence of any alien artifact had yet been found, the arm would take no chances. Any possibility of galactic destruction was too much to risk. The core commander would have to be found and destroyed immediately. The core forces were proving more tenacious than had been expected. Fighting was difficult on a world with no land masses and the tremendous native sea serpents which struck without warning took their toll on the arm naval units. Moreover, it appeared that the Corps commander had been active for longer than expected, and had established a large floating base on Hydros. The base would have to be taken. The Corps had been successfully wiped out on Hydros, but it was stronger and better established on the neighboring world, Lush. 
newly developed hovercraft technology allowed core units to move easily across the rivers and bogs of the steaming, swampy planet, which gave them a decided advantage over the clumsier arm vehicles. The arm commander knew that, on Lush, the capture and duplication of this technology was the key to a successful campaign. Arm scientists had managed to reverse engineer the captured enemy hovercraft, allowing them to build new units on equal footing with the core. Now the arm commander wanted to push eastward. Advance teams had spotted a glow emanating from the east, which gave weight to intelligence reports that the rumored alien artifact was indeed located somewhere on Lush. flyby mission established that the glow in the eastern skies was coming from within a massive structure of unknown origin. This was surely the alien device which the Corps commander intended to use. It appeared to be some sort of beacon. The arm would have to capture it first. The survival of the entire galaxy was at stake. Arm scientists examining the alien beacon found that it operated using macro-entanglement principles similar to their own galactic gates. Adjustable focal points represented a tremendous leap in the technology. However, they also provided the theoretical possibility of initiating a chain reaction, which could rapidly rematrix matter on a mind-boggling scale, causing a complete galactic collapse. This ultimate cataclysm was the goal of the Corps Commander. Before the scientists could devise a way to neutralize the threat of the beacon without destroying it, it was stolen by an ingenious team of Corps infiltrators posing as Muon analysis bots. The arm tracked the infiltration team to Temblor, third planet in the Ocelon system. The beacon had to be recaptured, before the Corps Commander could make use of it. Despite the constant earthquakes caused by the shifting plates of Temblor's surface, the Corps had managed to establish a sizable mobile base beyond one of the vaporous, seemingly bottomless pits near the northern striatic ridge. Core units were marshaled around this base as the armed forces advanced. It would be a battle to remember. The core mobile base on Temblor had been destroyed. Surviving core forces had made a strategic retreat to their northern stronghold. The surrounded Corps battalions quickly took defensive positions. The fighting would be intense, and the armed commanders suspected that the true intention of the stubborn defense was to buy time for the Corps commander to convert the alien beacon and complete an implosion device. The Corps commander had retreated to Gelidus, outermost planet of the Ocelon system. This was a glittering world of ice, frozen but far from still. Winds blew fiercely and unpredictably, driving tremendous storms which dropped hailstones as large as boulders, a rain of destruction for anything which lay below. But all dangers were secondary compared to the threat posed by the Corps commander and his terrible mission. Beset by core forces and battered by the nearly constant hailstorms on the frozen planet, the arm had nevertheless won a foothold on the ice flows of Gelidus. Core troops withdrew to the west, towards the mainland, with the arm in pursuit. The core was running out of room, but the arm was running out of time. The Corps 
commander was sealed within a massive glacial fortress high in Gelidus' northern quadrant. He was cornered, but had reached his goal. The converted alien beacon was also housed in the fortress. Time was now the arm's greatest enemy. As the corps commander worked to complete his doomsday preparations, and activate the device which would destroy the galaxy. After 4,000 years of fighting, the war was over. The once powerful core civilization had been wiped out of existence. Or at least, that was how it seemed. The Calculating Corps was never without a contingency plan. A Corps commander lying dormant on the far-off world of Hydros had been awakened after a hundred years to carry out one final mission. An ancient alien artifact, known to exist somewhere within the Ocelon system, contained technology which would allow the commander to complete an implosion device of incredible power. This device would do no less than collapse the entire galaxy, bringing the core final victory in the complete annihilation of its age-old enemy, the Arm. But the Arm had somehow found out about the plan, and had arrived on Hydros. The battle was on. Armed forces were arriving in ever-increasing numbers. The Corps had not expected this threat so early. The implosion device was incomplete without the technology of the alien artifact which had yet to be located. Defenses were hastily constructed as Corps troops fought to keep the attackers at bay. Much of Hydros had fallen to the arm as Corps troops were overwhelmed by sheer numbers. The Corps regrouped at its primary undersea base at Koala Reef in an effort to hold its ground there while the search for the alien artifact continued on the other planets in the system. Orbital sensors had revealed that the artifact sought by the Corps was somewhere on Lush, second planet in the Ocelan system. Corps scouts began a methodical ground search through the dense vegetation which flourished everywhere. Newly developed hovercraft technology aided their efforts across the swamps and bogs of Lush. Things became more difficult for the Corps on Lush when the Arm was able to capture and recreate the hovercraft technology which Corps had hoped would give them a significant advantage. Worse yet, the Arm was definitely aware of the existence of the alien artifact and Arm scouts were actively searching for it. The race was on. The most serious threat to the Corps' plan came when the Arm managed to recover the alien artifact before the Corps could reach it. It was now being kept and studied at the Arm's largest installation on Lush. Though it would be heavily guarded, the Corps commander's path was clear. The artifact must be captured or all would be lost. The assault on the Arm Fortress was successful, and the Corps at last had the alien artifact in its grasp. Gluon decay dating showed the object, which appeared to be a beacon of some sort, to be several million years old at a minimum. The Corps commander traveled to Asalan III, also known as Temblor, to draw the Arm's attention there while Corps scientists on the outermost planet examined the beacon. Temblor was a dangerous and unsteady world, its shifting surface racked by spasmodic earthquakes. 
The core now pushed across subsector 55, where great wounds in the planet's crust leaked noxious gases from somewhere far below. To the south, the arm lay waiting. The Arm had captured a vital core base in Temblor's southern hemisphere, but in occupying it, the troops had sacrificed valuable mobility and left themselves vulnerable to counterattack. The core commander saw the opportunity and moved in for the kill. The implosion device was nearly complete when the arm invaded the icy outer world of Gelidus. The initial landing took place on a drifting ice flow near the largest continent. The Corps commander moved to intercept the arm before it could reach the mainland where the device was housed. The Corps had inflicted heavy casualties upon the enemy, but arm reinforcements seemed endless. Corps troops massed at Rijlak outpost as they prepared for a new offensive. They were all that stood between the arm battalions and the mountain fortress where Corps scientists made final adjustments on the galactic implosion device. The galactic implosion device was ready at last and powering up to activation. But the arm was blasting at the gates of the glacial stronghold. The Corps commander had to hold the enemy at bay just a short while longer. Nothing else mattered. <laughs> 